Okay, welcome to uh, Psych 230, Social Psychology. Today we are starting chapter four, uh, which is on the self. Now we did talk about the self already in chapter three, uh, but we just introduced it, talked a little bit about it. This whole chapter now is about the self. And uh, I think it's interesting. I hope you find it interesting too. So we're gonna talk about all this stuff. We're gonna talk about, uh, actually self-presentation is really what we're gonna talk about, which is part of the self, right? Uh, we're going to talk about what self-presentation is, why we self-present, when we do it, more about self-presentation, the nature of it, and the goals of self-presentation. <clears throat> and this gets pretty interesting. I hope you find it interesting, but we have to save the discussion until after, after the recording is over. So what is, is self-presentation? So self-presentation is the process through which we try to control the impressions people form of us. Same thing as impression management. In, uh, if you take a marketing class, that's known as impression management. In a marketing class, um, you'll learn some similar things that you would in a social psychology class. So we're talking about the self here, right? Um, and yes, uh, we self-present, okay? We want people to think certain things of us. We try to control those impressions. We usually want people to think that we're nice, that we're good people, right? that we're hardworking, whatever it is, we try to control those impressions. And there's a certain way that we do that. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Yeah, but to some extent, uh, we're all at least a little bit phony, okay? Cause we don't want people to know everything about us or be able to see us in a certain light. We try to control what people see, try to influence what they think of, uh, about us. That is self-presentation. Why do we self-present? Uh, there are several reasons, okay? Um, but one reason is to uh, acquire desirable resources and avoid punishment. So we want certain things from people. That's why we self-present. So maybe we want to get a job. So we present ourselves, let's say to the boss or the person who's uh, doing the hiring, right? Um, as someone who is responsible, someone who is competent, right? Someone who's nice and committed, all those things, right? We want a job. Or maybe you want a date, right? Valentine's Day is coming up and maybe you want a date, okay? So you present yourself as a desirable person. You dress well, right? You're polite, you're nice, right? You wanna come across as someone who deserves a date, maybe from a specific person or you know, whoever it may be, right? We want people to think nice things of us so that we get desirable things, jobs, dates, uh, money, favors, all kinds of things. And we wanna avoid punishment. We don't wanna get fired. So we wanna present ourselves in a good light at work, right? We don't wanna get dumped. If you like the person you're with, right? So you try to present yourself in a good way, right? We wanna acquire desirable resources and avoid punishment. We want good things. We wanna avoid the bad, the bad things, right? And that's why we self-present. We want to show uh, ourselves in a certain way. Okay, that's what it's about. <clears throat> we also do it to facilitate social encounters. Really, that's about getting along with people. We don't wanna cause trouble. We don't wanna get into trouble, that kind of stuff. So often we will play the part. So sometimes we'll be nice. So we don't create difficulties. We don't create uncomfortable situations. So sometimes people can be rude and mean, but we'll just let it go because we don't wanna get into it, right? We don't wanna get into an argument. It might be someone that you don't even know, right? Someone that you don't really care about that said something mean. So you just ignore it, right? You play the part, you go on about your day, you pretend it doesn't bother you. Or maybe if you're in a group and somebody says something mean, you kind of ignore it, pretend it didn't happen, something like that and continue to be nice. Because we should not always confront people. Sometimes we just need to play the part, pretend we're still nice, pretend we're not upset, that kind of stuff. You never know sometimes, especially when you're dealing with a stranger, who you might be dealing with. And if somebody's rude, somebody cuts you off in line, or let's say uh, on the road when you're driving, and let's say you don't let it go, you don't play the part, you're not nice, so just, you know, to just let it go. Instead, you decide to retaliate and be mean. You never know who you're dealing with, and that person may actually try to kill you. Okay, maybe a really horrible person that pulls a gun on you or something like that. Uh, even let's say at the fair, right? Somebody cut in, cut in line in front of you. And if you don't play the part, you're gonna say something like, hey man, what the hell is your problem? I, like, you, you can't do this. This is, 
what, what the hell? And then it turns out that it's some really big, tough guy who doesn't mind going to prison. And he's going to teach you a lesson. Even though he was mean first, he's going to now teach you a lesson for standing up to him, right? We often don't want to get into those kind of situations, whether it's with a stranger or with a relative or with significant other, right? So sometimes we'll just let things go. We'll play the part and continue to be nice, even though the person said something mean, something racist, something sexist, right? Or they did something bad. Sometimes we don't let it go and we should not, by the way. But many times we will because we want to facilitate social encounters. We want to get along with people. We don't want to cause trouble. Let's keep going. Why do people self-present? So other reasons, to help construct their self-images. We also self-present because it affects what we think about ourselves. Remember our self-concept, right? Uh, is basically an idea of who we are. So our self-concept, who we think we are, is affected by how others perceive us. So if people perceive us to be incompetent, a slav, right? Uh, mean, rude, whatever it is, that affects what we think of ourselves. So we also present ourselves to people in a certain way. So they th they'll think nice things about us. And so we can continue to think nice things about ourselves. And of course, that will also affect our self-esteem. Uh, self-perception is how we present ourselves. Well, self-perception, what that really says is that how we present ourselves affects what we perceive and feel about ourselves. So it's not just others who we are, self, we are presenting for. We're also presenting for ourselves. When you look at yourself in a mirror and you see someone with a smile, someone who's well-groomed, someone who looks like you know, a decent person, uh, then you're more likely to believe that you are a decent person. Even if you're not looking in the mirror, the way you behave, the way you dress, all those things affect how what you think about yourself and how you feel. So you can dress well and feel well. It's, something's been said about that, that when you, uh, you know, you dress up to look good, you also feel good, okay? Yes, what you do uh, doesn't just affect what people think about you, but it also affects what you think of yourself. So we self-present all the time, some of us more than others, okay? Not just for others, but also for ourselves. When do people self-present? When others are paying attention. We do it more when other people are paying attention. So if we're in class, let's say face-to-face -face class, or at the mall, or somewhere where there's people, right? We're more likely to self-present, more likely to show a certain part of ourselves or show ourselves off in a certain way than when we're alone. When we're in public, things are different, right? You usually wanna be well-dressed, well-groomed, right? You brushed your teeth, right? You try to be nice, try to be reasonable, that kind of stuff, right? But privately, when you're all by yourself, right? Who are you then? Okay, how are you dressed? You might be dressed differently. Have you even taken a shower? Have you brushed your teeth? Have you combed your hair, right? Uh, you'd be surprised. Some people don't bother to do that stuff if they're by themselves. I know most of you do, most people do, right? Maybe all of you, I don't wanna you know, point out any, anyone in particular. I don't really know if there are any of you who don't do that. But when we're in private, most of us are at least a little bit different. Some of us are very different and we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, privately, maybe you may cuss, maybe not really comb your hair that much. Maybe you wear clothes that are just you know, more casual, let's say, whereas in public, you're more well-dressed, maybe more formal or whatever it is. Um, but that's part of our private self. People aren't paying attention that much. We don't need to present ourselves as much. We don't need to play the part as much, okay? When others control important goals and outcomes, yes, when other people have things that we want, whether it's a job, a date, um, money, sex, a car, or a ride, a favor, whatever it is, right? Um, we're more likely to self-present, more likely to show ourselves off in a certain way. Not really show off, but present ourselves in a certain way because we want to be the kind of person who deserves that, okay? When we think others have unwanted impressions of us, Sometimes people think certain things about us that are not so good. Somebody may think maybe that you're a cheat or something like that, that you're, uh, you're awful, right? That you cheat on people and you're not honest, that kind of stuff, right? So you want to 
uh, correct those impressions. So you present yourself in a certain way, right? Uh, you know, you are, you try to be nicer to people or try to explain yourself that that time you were talking to that other girl, right? Uh, instead of that other, instead of the one that you're with, right? Um, that, uh, that that's just a friend, right? That it's not a romantic thing. You know, that kind of stuff. I once, um, um, you know, lost a potential relationship because of something like that. I had met this girl, we were talking, we were getting along, things were moving in the right direction. You know, I thought it was gonna turn into something. And then one day in high school, this was in high school, uh, she saw me talking to some other girl, being friendly and stuff like that, not doing anything really uh, uh, romantic or anything like that, but talking to the girl in that way. And she got jealous and she didn't wanna to talk to me afterward and never let me explain. And you know what the situation was? That girl is actually my cousin. But I was never able to explain. She just thought I was horrible afterward. After that, I know that's uh, you know a little bit extreme, right? When you don't even give somebody a chance to even you know explain, right? Like, hey, it's not what you think, right? That kind of stuff, right? Uh, and that's an overreaction. But yes, you know, we try to correct things. You know, um, maybe somebody sees you once uh, that you're uh, they come by your house unannounced. And they see you in clothes that are, you know, torn and stained or whatever it is, and like you feel embarrassed, and so therefore, next time you see them, you want to be well dressed, and and you try to explain, like, hey man, you caught me at a bad time. I was working on the car, you know, and I'm not gonna use my best clothes for that. I'm gonna use my jeans. I already have some holes in them, you know, because I don't want to ruin the good ones. And yeah, I'm gonna get some grease on me and that kind of stuff. It's like it doesn't mean I'm a slob, right? And you try to to um, correct these unwanted impressions. You know, I remember another time when I was just, I had just uh, started college and I was, uh, I was working out, I was in the weight room because I used to work out back then. I used to work out a lot actually. I'm still active, but I don't lift weights. I just run, okay? I jog, I hike. But back then I used to, I used to play a lot of basketball. So I got plenty of, I got plenty of running, but I also used to um, actually work out and lift weights because I wanted to be buff. I didn't know back then that's just not in my physique, that it's just, I'm not that kind of person. I can't really get buff, okay? It's just not part of my genetics, okay? I'm not part of my biology. Yeah, I can get, you know, slightly bigger muscles and look really lean and stuff, but I'm not gonna turn into, into you know, one of those big buff guys. Um, anyway, so I was there working out and I, I was, and I, when I, I like to listen to music whenever I work out or when I'm jogging, whatever it is, but at this point I was working out, I was lifting weights and I was, uh, you know, this, this was back in the day. So, um, you know, hard rock grunge was in and that's what I was listening to. I was rocking out, I was working out. Um, and it just so happens that, you know, in that weight room, uh, and this was in, uh, in, in, in college, actually it was at MIT where I was at the time. Uh, you know, the, there was a big glass wall in the hallway and people can see as they, you know, as they pass by, they can see you working out there because there's a big wall that was just a piece, big piece of glass, okay? And I'm there by myself working out, listening to music. And I start getting into it and, uh, and, and I make this face like, yeah, you know, like that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and as this girl's passing by, I'm working out and like, she looks at me like, oh my God, who the hell are you? It's like, I, I, I must've looked like some, I don't know, some evil guy to her like that. You know, those faces sometimes like the rocker dudes make, like the rockers make like, yeah, man, yeah, dude, like that kind of stuff, you know, but. Uh, I had long hair back then, by the way, because I wanted to be one of these rocker dudes. And she looked at me like, oh, my God, I'm afraid of you. Like, <laughs> and like, and then I, 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 right after that, my expression changes like, no, 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 it's not what you think. right? I'm really a nice guy. I'm just working out here and I'm getting into this song. Right. And I'm getting pumped up, so to speak. And that's what happens. You self present. You want to correct these impressions. Maybe it's your teacher thinks a certain way of you. Maybe your teacher thinks you're incompetent or lazy or whatever it is or your boss or your significant other, or just somebody passing by, right? Um, but yeah, we self-present more when we think people uh, have impressions of us that we don't like, and we try to correct those, sometimes un unsuccessfully. Um, when do people self-present? Well, more about this, okay? So self-monitoring, okay, so um, I think I mentioned this before, but self-monitoring is basically the degree to which you are concerned with your public image and you adjust your actions to fit the current situation. Self-monitoring is basically the extent to which you care what other people think of you, okay? If you care a lot, then you'll do a lot to show people what they wanna see. If you don't care so much, 
then you're gonna just be yourself, okay? In you know any given situation, you're gonna be more yourself, okay? You can be at the extreme end and be extremely fake and always show people what they wanna see. And you can be at the other extreme where you don't give a damn and you're just gonna be yourself every single time and you don't care, right? What you're wearing, whether it's raggedy old clothes, you're gonna burn, fart, doesn't matter, right? You're gonna talk or you want, maybe you wanna cuss, you're gonna cuss. Most of us are probably somewhere in the middle. Some of us are a little bit higher in self-monitoring than others. Some of us are lower, but that's what that's about. The extent to which we're concerned with what other people think of us, our, our public image. So we have uh, what we call high self-monitors and low self-monitors. You could be somewhere in the middle, and I already described this, but high self-monitors um, are people who are inconsistent across situations, okay? So they want to show you what you want to see, okay? So they will... Uh, the worst way to think of this is that they're fake, okay? These are the people, for instance, who are, well, I'll tell you a little about that in a moment, but they're good at assessing what other people want. They're good at knowing those things, figuring out what other people want, and they tailor their behavior to fit those demands. They change their behavior, the way they talk, uh, the way they, uh, the way they, you know, the, the way they look um, to fit in with that, you know, to fit in basically. And like I said, at worst, these people are fake. Let me give you an example. This is the person, for instance, who will be, uh, for instance, who will laugh at the boss's jokes, right? When the boss says a joke, oh, they're laughing hysterically. Oh my God, you're so funny. And then you, as one of their coworkers, they treat you like crap. No, you're not funny. You're a piece of crap. Oh, but they're kissing ass to the boss by, you know, laughing, you know, when it's some fake laugh, right? I hate those kind of people to tell you the truth, right? But it's just, it's that kind of thing, you know? They're mean to people who are like them or people below them, but they're really nice to the people above, to the boss, right? They'll, they'll pretend to love everything they say and agree with them and laugh at their jokes, right? That's a high self-monitor for you. Another example of that, a politician. They will say what they need to say, what, you, what they think you wanna hear so that they can get elected and stay in office. And we're seeing that right now, the extent to which people are twisting uh, their words, right? Uh, trying to come up with explanations for things that they've been caught doing wrong and the dishonesty, right? It's just, it bothers me to tell you the truth, right? Um, but those are your high self monitors. They're not always bad people, but sometimes they are, right? Uh, your politicians, most of them are just, uh, they're fake, okay? Uh, they, they're just, a lot of them are liars, okay? They want to stay in office, they do anything to stay in office, okay? Um, they want to look like the kind of people who get elected, nice, decent, they tell the truth, but in reality, they lie a lot and they're, they're full of crap, a lot of them, okay? Um, but also your car salesman, right, has to be a high self-monitor. You want to be a good car salesman or a good salesman in general, you need to be a high self-monitor. You need to pretend to like people and pretend to agree with them. And I've seen people just outright lie, you know? Um, you're gonna go buy a car and you tell the car salesman, oh yeah, I went to college, I went to UCLA and stuff like that. And I'm not saying I did, but I'm gonna say you tell them that. And, uh, and, they, and they say, oh, that's so nice. And they'll say, yeah, I went there too. Actually, I have a cousin who goes there. And they start telling you all this stuff. And sometimes those are just outright lies. They wanna be the kind of person that you'd get along with so that then you'd buy the car. Same thing with an insurance salesman, people like that. They're not all that bad. But I've run across some really bad ones. I've, I've run I, my first insurance salesman. He pretended that he was just like me. Oh yeah, I went there too. Oh yeah, me too. I like that too. I also do that, you know, because I'm friendly and stuff like that. And once he got the sale, once I signed up for the insurance and he got his commission, he got his cut, right? After that, he wouldn't even take my damn phone calls because I had some issues. I was trying to, you know, get everything. I had to submit some paperwork, stuff like that. Like, no, he'd gotten his commission. He, he would ignore my calls and it's, it was just awful, okay? As, as soon as that thing, six month policy expired, I dumped that insurance, okay? That, because of that one person, right? So fake, so awful. But they're not always really, you know, that bad is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm pointing them out as if they're all really bad. But it just means that they, they care a lot about what people think. So they try to fit in, they try to get along. They're not always mean about it. They're not always like, just trying to get something, but sometimes they just, they care about what people think about them a lot, okay? And then there are your low self-monitors, and I can describe low self-monitors in really bad ways too if I wanted to, but these are the people who focus internally how to decide to act, right? They are going to be themselves, whether they're in class, at work, or whatever they are at the party, they're going to be themselves. 
okay? Uh, they don't change much across situations. So you'll get the real person, right? They'll kind of dress the same way at home as they do at work, if they're allowed to, or in class. At the party, they'll talk however they want. If they like to cuss, they'll cuss, right? If they, uh, like I said, um, you know, if they uh, want to talk about certain things, they'll talk about those things, even if maybe you don't like those things. Um, doesn't sound as bad as the high self monitors. You can tell the high self monitors really bother me, but uh, the ones that are really fake, okay? Uh, but the low self monitors, um, they can be bad too, right? Um, so the high self monitors can be very fake. The low self monitors, the, the worst version of low self monitors are, are the people who are very insensitive. They don't care what you think and they will say whatever mean thing uh, burp in your face, you know, fart around you. Uh, they just don't give a damn. They'll be a, as mean, as awful as they want to be. It doesn't matter if they're in class, at work. And that could be really bad too. Most of us, we care somewhat, right? Maybe not too little, but most of us are somewhere in the middle. I got to be honest with you, I care somewhat, right? I, don't, I wouldn't consider myself a high self-monitor. Self -monitor. I think I'm closer to the low end, but I care a little bit. I have to because, uh, you know, I have a job and people do per have perceive me in a certain way, right? Um, but now we're having classes via Zoom. So I'm at home. So I'm not really, uh, I'm not dressing the same way. I'm wearing a sweatshirt. Sometimes I'm just wearing the same shirt I would wear when I like would go and uh, like exercise, right? Sometimes right after class, I, I mean, I, I will already be dressed for my workout. So as soon as class ends, I can just get in my car, hit the road, go to the hills and start immediately. Right, because I'm at uh, I'm at home. I don't really care as much at home. But if I were face to face, then you would see me in my slacks and my button down shirt. You'll still see some of that stuff at home here. Um, you know, when it gets a little bit warmer, I'll start wearing some of those clothes. You know, the short sleeve, you know, button shirt, the polo shirt, whatever it is. It's semi casual, okay, or you know that kind of stuff. Uh, I care somewhat. I don't care a whole lot, but I do try to, you know. Uh, be nice, you know, and uh, nicer than I actually am. I'm a little bit nicer to my students than I really am in person. I am a nice person, but I think when, when I'm with my students, right, when, when I'm dealing with students, I'm a, I, I am nicer, actually. I, you know, it's part of my job, okay, <laughs> so, so to speak, right? I have to be nice to students. I'm not saying I'm not nice, but um, I, I think I come across a lot nicer as a student than I do as a, as a person, okay, the, just outside of that. It's just part of the job that I have to be a little bit nicer, but I'm not being fake. It really is who I am, but it's just a, I'm a little bit more nice. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was wondering where do you guys stand, right? And there is, by the way, a scale, a questionnaire that measures the extent to which you're a high self monitor or a low self monitor, right? And if you're doing an honors project for my class, maybe you want, might wanna think about that, right? Uh, about, because you're gonna have to do your own research or maybe you wanna do something about that. Or maybe if you're in my research methods class or, or in some other class and you're also doing an honors project, right? This is something that's interesting that relates to so many different things, okay? So yeah, that's the extent to which uh, we monitor ourselves and adjust our behavior and our speech and all that stuff. The nature of self-presentation, okay, says more often than not, right? More often our self-presentations focus on emphasizing our strengths, right? putting forth uh, our best foot forward, basically, and minimizing our weaknesses. Especially when we first meet someone, uh, we wanna talk about the positive things about ourselves, right? And uh, ignore the negative stuff. We want someone to like us. So we try to be nice. We say the, the things that are working for us, right? And we kind of don't wanna talk about our weaknesses so much. And that's why it's not until later, it's not until you've been around a person for a while that you'll realize who they really are because the bad side, the bad stuff will come out later. By the way, if you see the bad stuff right away, you need to run, okay? If you see it right away, then there's much worse stuff coming later, okay? I should have seen the, that coming with my wife. <laughs> the first time we went out, we argued. She got mad at me the first night, the first time we went out. The first time. You know, I didn't even think I was going to get a second date. I didn't do anything bad. I just wanted to hold her hand. She got mad at me. And I said, and then the, the whole thing ended and stuff like that. I said, oh, well, I guess this isn't going anywhere, right? And uh, it actually did, but uh, you know, I should have seen it coming, so to speak. Uh, I, and uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's really mean, okay? Um, easily frustrated and uh, hard to get along with, right? I, you know, I consider myself a nice person. I get along with most people. Uh, and, uh, you know, but what I'm saying is at the beginning, everybody puts their best foot forward, so to speak, right? Even your worst cheaters, your 
awful people will try to come across as being nice and reasonable uh, at the beginning, okay? So because people do this, because they self-present, okay, and they want to emphasize their strengths and kind of ignore their weaknesses, um, a lot of people might be lying, okay? Self-presentation is sometimes just deceptive. People are sometimes just lying, telling you, uh, just agreeing with you on certain things so you'll like them. Oh, yeah, I like that person. Too. Oh, I like that kind of music too. Oh, I, that's my favorite food also, or that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> or whatever it is, right? Those are simple lies, not, not really big lies, but you'd be surprised the extent to which people will, will lie to you. And then you'll find out later on, I thought you liked that, right? No, I was just trying to get you to like me, right? Um, that kind of stuff, right? So because trust is important, people go to great lengths to detect liars. Okay, we want to spot the liars. We want to see them, right? So we can avoid them, right? Uh, and there are certain things that give away when somebody is lying. Okay, and let's see. And so lie detection becomes uh, something that's important. Now, something that's used sometimes by law enforcement or other people, you know, just for fun or in, in talk shows and things like that is something called the polygraph. Polygraph is this machine, basically, um, that has some wires sticking out of it and they, and they hook up those wires to your skin, uh, you know, little wires or little suction cups, whatever it is. And they, will, and they basically are trying to record the electrical conductivity of your skin. Because, you know, when you're lying and it bothers you, you start sweating a little bit, even, if, even though you don't perceive it, maybe it's just minimal, but that changes the electrical conductivity of your skin. It conducts a little bit more electricity. Your blood pressure goes up if you are lying and it bothers you. Your heart rate goes up, your respiration. So they, they measure things like that. Electroconductivity, heart rate, blood pressure, all that stuff, right? And that's part of the polygraph. They're trying to determine if you're lying because if, you, if they ask you a question and if you're lying, you know you're lying, then it should bother you. And um, it, that should show up on those measures. Your heart rate should go up, your, you know, your heart rate, your galvanic skin response is what that's called, the electroconductivity of the skin. Um, and they can, uh, you know, guess to some extent that you're probably lying. If you're telling the truth, maybe it doesn't bother you very much. So therefore, those things shouldn't change very much. Okay. So people can become physiologically aroused when lying. And I'm not talking about sexual arousal. I'm talking about just the blood pressure, the heart rate, right? The electroconductivity of the skin, um, that kind of stuff. However, I will tell you that some people are really good at lying. And these are the people you want to watch out for, but they're hard to detect. Even if you hook them up to the polygraph, they can lie and it doesn't bother them. They'll see no, no difference in the, in, in the uh, polygraph measures or any of these measures, no difference whatsoever. You know, whether they're telling the truth or whether they're lying, you won't be able to detect it. Actually, you'll think they're telling the truth, but you ask them a normal question that no one would lie about, right? You see their normal baseline responses. And then you ask them a question to see if they're lying and they lie to you but the machine doesn't show it. Those are your stone cold liars, the people who can lie and be believable. They're actually, you know, they can be uh, dangerous. These are the people who basically can say and do anything and they don't care, okay? Um, you know, like your cold blooded serial killer murderer, right? They'll lie to your face and they, you won't see a single change that indicates that they might be lying they, you, they won't look uncomfortable or anything most of us are uncomfortable when we know we're lying those people would not be and you don't have to be a serial killer or a murderer but just there's people like that who can lie to your face and get away with it and be very convincing and even the machine won't be able to detect them okay um that's that's an issue okay and then there's people who are uh, the other way who uh, they get really nervous when they're questioned and the machine might say that they're lying or when you question them, you might think they're lying because they get nervous when you question them, but they're still telling the truth. So the machine might say they're lying. You might think they're lying when you look at their, you know, their expression and you look at how worried they look. Uh, you can also look at body language, by the way, to give you a hint about whether they're lying. They will look like they're lying, but they're really telling the truth. It's just that they're very anxious people. They get easily stressed out. And most of us are somewhere in the middle where we basically, when we tell the truth, we're okay, we're comfortable. And when we don't tell the truth, we're uncomfortable. Okay, so the machine works for most people, but it doesn't work for some people. It doesn't work for those stone cold liars, right? And it doesn't work for the people who get stressed out very easily, the very, very anxious people, okay? Or people who are highly neurotic, that kind of stuff. 
you can also tell, like I said, when somebody's lying by by body language and stuff like that, you know, the, the nods, the shaking of the head, the movement of the legs, things like that, okay? When something bothers people, you'll, you'll see certain movements to their body, okay? But I, we don't get into that too much. We, I mean, I told you guys a little bit already. But yeah, I, I had more information before, but because I like discussion, I, you know, I cut some of that stuff out so we can talk about it. But now that we're doing things remotely, well then, well, well then we have to wait until the end, okay? Um, all right, now the goals of self-presentation. These are, these are very important, right? What are the goals? What are we trying to accomplish when we self-present, okay? So here are the three goals of self-presentation. One is we wanna appear likable. We want people to like us. So we'll use what are called ingratiation strategies, which is just an attempt to get others to like us. And we'll talk about several of those. We also wanna appear competent. So we want people to think basically that we're smart, that we're, we know what we're doing, that kind of stuff, right? So for that, we use what are called self-promotional strategies, strategies that promote us, right? An attempt to get others to see us as competent, okay? And we also want to appear powerful. And we'll use what are called status and power enhancing strategies. We'll use strategies that make us look like we're higher status, we're more of a big shot, right? Someone with more power, more influence, that kind of stuff. Some of you might be thinking, I don't care about being likable. I don't care about being powerful and stuff like that. Uh, these are important to everyone to some extent. The, sometimes they're more important to some than others, okay? But these are the three goals. And here are the strategies for the first goal. The first goal is to appear likable. So how can we appear likable according to research? One, so this is useful by the way, if you just want people to like you, you should pay attention to this, right? One way to get people to like you is just to express liking for others. And we'll talk about what that involves, although it should be obvious. Another one is to create similarity, right? Another one is to make ourselves physically attractive. That's a big one. That's a lot, something that just about everybody does, okay, to some extent. Another one is to project modesty. Okay, so let me go through these, right? One of the strategies here, we want to appear likable. So one is to oppress liking for others. Very simply, if you want people to like them, act like you like them, okay? Or maybe even tell them you like them. If you like them and you're nice to them, you treat them well, they're more likely to like you. We can express our liking for others by, with verbal flattery, compliments. You know, you can say things like, oh, I like your hair, you know, it's like, wow, it looks really pretty or whatever it is. Or like, wow, man, that's a cool jacket you're wearing. Where'd you get that? You know, oh, seeking advice. Yeah, where can I get a jacket like that? That looks really cool. I wish I had a jacket like that. Or like, man, that's a cool car, dude. Like how many horse, how much horsepower does it have? Damn, how much did it cost you? How fast does it go? You know, it's like, uh, yeah, where can I get a car like that? Compliments, you know? Oh, you're so smart. You're so nice. You're so generous, that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be fake, okay? When you like someone, you do this naturally. You say they're wonderful, that they're pretty. You do this with people you like. People, of, of course, will also do this in a, so, you know, uh, in a fake sort of way just to get people to like them. And we'll give you compliments just to get something from you, okay? Um, also nonverbal behavior, like smiling. If you smile more, people are more likely to like you. Research shows that when you smile, you actually look more attractive. You're more likable. People are more likely to think you're nice, right? When you mimic other people, in other words, when you do what they do, so if they smile, you smile. If they nod, you nod, right? If, uh, you know, they're dressed uh, casually, you dress casually, right? If they're dressed formally, you dress formally, right? That's why we try to fit in, right? Um, that's part of the nonverbal stuff. We want to, you know, act like those people and dress like that. And they're more likely to like us, more likely to accept us. We copy the behavior of those we like, right? Smiling, leg crossing, like I said, right? That's another way to get people to like you, okay? So if you want people to like you, say nice things about them and uh, smile at them, act like them, look like them, right? Because uh, that's what happens. A, a lot of people actually end up being friends or in, end up uh, being together even romantically because they are similar. Let's say you're some, uh, some crazy dude, right? That, um, you know, with a mohawk, a big bright green mohawk and tattoos and piercings and you wear these clothes with other holes, right? You're that kind of dude, let's say, right? 
And then you meet some other girl, right? Who is also into that stuff, whatever they call it, punk or whatever it is. And yeah, she has the tattoos and the piercings. She's got half her head shaved on one side and the other, the other side is kind of sticking out like a, whatever it is. I've seen stuff like that. I saw something like that recently. When these two people find each other, it's like, hey man, you're just like me. It's really what they're thinking. And they're more likely to talk. They're more likely to get together and actually end up being together. You're more likely to like people like that. Oh, and by the way, I'm getting into uh, similarity, expressing similarity. Yeah, when somebody is similar to you, they make you feel like, hey, you're okay. They're just like you. So therefore, you must be okay. So expressing similarity. I told you guys about that already, but that's, that's another way to be likable is to basically look and act like those people, right? Like the same music, you know, like the same sort of stuff. An experiment by Zana and Pack in 1975, I know it's an old study, but it's very important, right? Uh, showed that the extent to which women will create similarity um, when they're expecting to meet someone. So women anticipated interacting with a man who was either highly desirable or not so highly desirable. So they were told that they were gonna be meeting a man who was highly desirable. Half of them were told they're gonna meet a man who's highly desirable. Who is this man, right? Tall, attractive. They got to see a picture, right? Uh, very smart and has these degrees. I don't remember all the details, but let's say smart has you know an advanced degree, has a good job and makes a whole bunch of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, let's say, right? Um, back then it might've been a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Today it might be more like this person makes half a million dollars or something like that per year. A highly desirable man, right? Good looking, good job, uh, nice or whatever it is, you know, all those things, right? And others were told they were gonna be interacting, they're gonna be meeting a man that's not so highly desirable. Picture, right? Not so attractive, doesn't make that much money. Um, and some other things about the person that show that they're not that desirable, okay? I know it sounds mean, but that's what they did. And then they were also told that the man also had either traditional views of women or untraditional views of women. So they were told that this man, right, um, you know, basically likes traditional women, that he believes that the ideal woman is someone who's passive, someone who stays at home and takes care of the kids, right? Uh, someone who is, you know, listens to her husband and just supports her husband, that kind of stuff. You know, the traditional roles of women that you're just there basically to take care of the kids and your husband and to take care of the house and that kind of stuff, right? And sometimes the women were told that, they, that the man had an untraditional view of women. He believes the ideal woman is independent, ambitious, uh, you know, um, basically wants to have her own job and be successful and, and, and basically go to school and get a college education, that kind of stuff, right? So here's the thing though. Uh, so we have a situation where the, uh, where women were gonna be meeting a man who are gonna be, are told they're gonna be meeting a man who's either highly desirable or not highly desirable, and who is either, who either likes traditional women or likes women who are not so traditional. So you could be meeting a man who, let's say, who is highly desirable and has traditional views of women, or a man that's highly desirable and has untraditional views of women, or a man who's undesirable and has traditional views of women, or a man who's undesirable and has untraditional views of women. Right, there's four possibilities. Now I'm not gonna show you all the four possibilities. I'm only gonna show you the interesting stuff, but this is what the results found. Oh, by the way, I wanna point out before I show you the results is that, because it doesn't say there, cause I had to cut out some stuff so it's, we don't have too many slides. Um, the women were then told to write something where they're telling the man about what they are like. Tell us about yourself, right? And this is what they found. When it comes, and this has to do with expressing similarity. Oh yeah, the, so yeah, here's the information. The women then reported their own attitudes about gender roles for the male student to look at. They filled out you know, uh, you know, a form, right? Speaking of uh, where they talked about like what they are like, in other words, okay? So yeah, I did have a slide for that. And this is what they found. The amount of attitude conformity shift toward the man's view. In other words, to what extent did the women say that they are just like him? Okay, so you can see for the undesirable man, there was no attitude shift. The women did not really say, hey, I'm just like you. In other words, the women were kind of more honest. If they believe in traditional views of women, they said that. If they believe that in untraditional views, they said that too. They didn't really shift their opinion one way or the other for this undesirable man. 
But look, for the desirable men, there was a big shift there. On a scale of zero to five, it was 3.7. They were basically saying, oh, I'm just like you. I also believe that, right? So they're self-presenting a lot more when they see or they think they're going to meet a man who's highly desirable. And here's the bad news, right, about those women. This was like a, 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 an experiment, a, a study, basically. They found out later that there is no such man, right? We, just, we were just studying this stuff. We wanted to see to what extent you would shift your attitude, right? So they basically, so there's a little bit more to it uh, that, than, than I'm expressing here. The, you know, they, they found out first what the women actually believed before knowing anything. And then once they found out about the man, then they were told to fill something up for him. And it turns out that, yeah, there was a lot of attitude shifting. A lot of women basically say, even though they believe one thing, they were likely to say something else just to be pleasing to this man. Oh, yeah, I believe in that too. Oh, sure, I would be glad to stay home, right? And just let you make all the money and take care of me and the kids and that kind of stuff. And sure, I'll raise the kids. You just go to work and that kind of stuff, right? That's what they did for the desirable man. The undesirable man, ah, not, not happening, okay? That's the reality. When there's people who are desirable, and you want them to like you, you're gonna wanna say that, oh yeah, me too, I also like that. I know not everybody does it, but on average, people do it a lot more uh, than, they, you know, than they otherwise would, okay? Everyone does it at least a little bit, and some people do it a lot. I'm not saying that they're all fake, but hey, you know what, if you meet someone, let's say you are a, uh, a Democrat, right? And you're like, some, you're like, you're like, hey, you know, Democrat all the way, right? And you meet some good looking man who's rich and wonderful in so many ways, but he happens to be a Republican. You know what you're gonna do? You're gonna become a Republican too, right? You wanna be with this man, that's what's gonna happen to you. And you're probably gonna do it willingly. Hardcore Trump supporter, guess what you're gonna be, right? That's what the research shows. Some of you are saying, I would never do that. No, no, Trump is horrible, whatever it is. Yes, there are people who just stick to their you know, whatever their opinions and, and will still disagree and maybe you still be with the man. But research shows that for the most part, you shift your opinions, your attitudes to basically fit in to get along. Because uh, if there's big things you disagree about, you're probably not going to stay together. Okay, so there's a lot of attitude shifting. People shift their political views, even their religion sometimes, right? Some more than others, but that's what's happening. And, uh, you know, hey, you find someone desirable, right? Uh, you're going to want to say that you're like them. And we're, we're going to talk about later on, when we get to the chapter on romantic attraction, the kind of people that we're attracted to. And who's more likely to get that shift, right? What kind of men? Well, we actually, I actually mentioned a little bit already, but what kind of women are considered more desirable and what kind of men are considered more desirable, right? And those are the people who are desirable, who are the ones that you're more likely to shift your attitudes, your opinions, the ones that you're more likely to say, hey, I'm just like you, or I believe that too, that kind of stuff, right? My wife actually became vegetarian because of me. I was vegetarian, she wasn't. First date was awkward. You know, I was eating something vegetarian, she was eating something, uh, it looked like pig ears to me, I don't remember what it was, but it was very awkward. Um, and then eventually she decided to be vegetarian, I guess just, I didn't say that she had to, right? I didn't say I'm, uh, you know, I'm not gonna be with you if you're not, but, um, you know, she eventually decided to, to be that way. And now she says she doesn't eat meat because meat is gross and all this stuff. And uh, I'm sure if, if it wasn't for me, she wouldn't be, okay? Um, and I didn't try to convince her, but that's what happens with people, you know, when you wanna be with certain people and you try to be like them. Um, okay, so people go to great lengths to appear physically attractive. Okay, so another strategy, let me make sure I keep track of time here because I feel like I'm saying a lot and I gotta keep track of time. Um, another thing you can do to make yourself likable, that's very obvious, is to make yourself more physically attractive. Physical attractiveness, okay? People go to great lengths to appear physically attractive. And I would love to ask you how, right? What do they do, right? And get your opinion, but I'm recording. But they do a lot of things. All of you do a lot of things. We all do something. Some of the, okay, there's the people who don't care that much. I know, okay, there are people like that, but most people care at least a little bit. Some people care a lot. Most people, I would say, care a lot about their physical attractiveness. So they comb their hair a certain way. They might wear the lipstick, the makeup, if you're a woman, right? Wear certain kinds of clothes that accentuate certain parts of your body, right? If you're a man, you want to look cool and manly or, you know, uh, right now, I don't know if it's going away anytime soon or if it's happened already, but I hear that beards are in, you know, and a lot of guys are growing beards and stuff, even though 
to tell you the truth, I think uh, I think that's kind of gross. I don't even like that, right? I'm not gonna grow a beard, right? And I can't even grow one, by the way. Okay, it's just not possible for me. Yeah, I can grow a little bit here, a little bit here. It doesn't even connect over here. Okay, it doesn't. I can't even grow what you call a goatee, let alone a beard, right? Um, but anyway, I, let's just say that's never gonna be me. Okay, I'm not gonna see me as a big bearded dude. Now, I know that some of you might be, I, I'm reminded of some of you might have seen the picture of me for uh, in the group me because the site club members were in there and you see me with a beard. Just so you are aware, I there I'm just kind of messing around and I, I, I put a fake beard on myself. You can do that kind of stuff on the internet just to, to look a certain way. And it's, just, uh, it's just joking, but I would never do that, okay? Um, so people do all sorts of things. They wear certain kinds of clothes, they wear makeup, you know, they comb their hair a certain way, uh, all sorts of things that people do. They go to great lengths, okay? Some people get nose jobs, some people get a tummy tuck, some people get liposuction, right? Or get stuff added to their butt to make their butt look bigger, uh, boob job, all sorts of things. I think when it comes to surgery, the boob job is number one, by the way, number one type of cosmetic surgery. Second, if I'm remembering correctly, is the nose job. Okay. But yeah, if you can afford it, right? Um, well, a lot of people are likely to do that. By the way, your celebrities that you see on TV uh, and even the people that uh, musicians that you love so much, you know, anyone who basically is famous and, and, and they're basically make a good living because they're famous, because of their music, or they're on TV, whatever it is. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee you that just about 100% of those people have had work done. There's a reason why they look so good. And they continue to look so good even when they get older. They're 50 years old. They still look good. They would still be able to attract a 20-something-year-old. Why? Cosmetic surgery. You can also keep yourself looking good in other ways by exercising and you know, try to stay younger. Exercise keeps you young, by the way. Um, and some people are naturally more attractive than others, even without trying. Or some people look younger than others, right? Some people can be you know, in their 40s and look like they're in their 20s just naturally because that's how they are. Part of, the, part of the reason for that, by the way, is, is basically is just staying fit, okay? And, and um, you know, that, that keeps you younger. And just exercising keeps your body younger, keeps you looking younger. Um, but attractive people, right? People go to great lengths to be attractive because there's certain rewards that attractive people get. Attractive people are more likely to be, to be seen as honest, right? Attractiveness has nothing to do with your honesty. But Research shows that people who are very attractive or people who are more attractive are seen as more honest, right? That's, that's surprising. Like what the heck do those two things have to do with each other? It's because we wanna like people who are attractive and more likely to think well of them. They're more likely to be hired for managerial positions. They're more likely to be promoted and elected to public office. Attractive people are given all sorts of things. They're just more likely to get a job in general, more likely to get a date, more likely to be elected to public office, more likely to be promoted, more likely to, you know, to, uh, to be the boss or whatever it is. And they even receive shorter sentences for felonies, right? That's awful, but it's true. Attractive people are less likely to get a long sentence, less likely to be thrown in jail and begin with or, or, or in prison. Some of you might've seen the documentary on Netflix about what's his name, um, what's his name, that, that serial killer guy? Um, I forget his name. Not Charles Manson, another guy who's supposed to be very good looking. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, uh, you know, they, they get shorter sentences. Uh, it, another thing you have to realize is that sometimes people get, become successful. And when they are successful and they have a lot more money, they can make themselves more attractive. You should see some of these, uh, what some of these people look like before they became famous or some of these tech leaders, right? that are the CEOs or leaders of, uh, of these billion dollar companies, when they were just starting off, they just look like dorks and geeks. And now that they're successful, and now they look attractive and desirable, right? The, all the stuff that you can do. And that's just men, women can do a lot more, but that's the truth. Uh, you know, according to research, people who are more attractive are just given more things, more jobs, better pay, less likely to be convicted, more likely to be elected to office. You want to date them. You, you want to be with them. You're more likely to have sex with them. And that's just the way it is. We bend over backwards for attractive people, so to speak. You know, and, uh, you know, some people uh, might have told you at the beginning when you were little that no one's going to give you a job because you're pretty. That is not true. They will give you everything because you're pretty. If you are pretty enough, by the way. Now, keep in mind, it's a relative thing. You might think you're pretty, but 
maybe you're not pretty enough for Hollywood, but maybe you are for the Animal Valley, right? Remember, we talked about comparison too, right? Uh, by the way, when they give you these things, there are strings attached though. Those people expect things in return when they give you that promotion. Sometimes they don't, but many times they do. They expect that at least you're going to be nice to them. Maybe they don't outright expect sex or something like that, but that you're at least going to be nice to them and talk to them, stuff like that. Um, but there's a reason why attractive people get these things because, you know, people want to like them. People, we want to be liked by those people. So we like them and we do nice things for them, hoping that they're going to do nice things for us, like go out with us or do things with us. It doesn't have to happen, but we still do it anyway. The attractive bartender gets big tips, right? It could be a he or a she, but, but especially females get the bigger tips. And guess what? The, the way guys are, it's like, uh, you know, we could know we have that we know we have absolutely no chance of getting a date out of that person. We'll still give her the bigger tip, right? We'll still do that just in case, right? Just in case, right? Uh, just maybe for a smile or whatever it is. It's, it's, we're just, I think we're biologically predisposed to just be nicer to more attractive people. And it's, it's just, uh, so obvious and so, uh, you know, it's just ridiculous the extent to which we treat people who are attractive very nicely. You can be attractive and homeless and you know what's going to happen? Before you know it, you won't be homeless. Somebody's going to scoop you out of there and say, hey, you belong with me. <laughs> um, I might be exaggerating, but, that's, that, but, but that is true. And keep in mind that it's, it's all relative, okay? Uh, I mean, I don't, you know, there's a lot more we can say about this, okay? Um, another way to appear likable is to project modesty. That means to be humble, okay? You're more likely to be likable. People are more likely to like you if you're humble. For instance, right, if you're doing well, let's say in a class, right, you know, you're getting an A or something like that, and, uh, and someone asks you, hey, how are you doing in that class, right? And you say, and you say oh, I'm doing okay. I'm, do I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm doing all right. You know, they're more likely to like you than if you say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting an A. Yeah, that class is easy for me. No big deal. Yeah, I'm awesome. You know, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> you know, people who brag, right, are not so likable. Or if they ask you, hey, what's your GPA? And you say, yeah, I got a 4.0. Oh, they miss smarty pants, miss know it all, right? That kind of stuff, right? They're not, they don't like you so much when you're doing better than they are or when you make them look bad or it just seems easy for you, right? So you have to be modest. Like, yeah, I'm just doing really well. I, I don't know why, you know, it's just like, I guess I'm just lucky, that kind of stuff, right? You have to be modest. When you're successful, you know, you want people to like, you have to be modest and say, yeah, I guess I just got lucky, you know, or, you know, people have really helped me and, uh, and, and, and that's why I'm successful, you know, it's not, it's not because of me. You have to say it's because of we, right? That kind of stuff. That's being modest. And that's more likely to be the case, by the way, if you're part of a collective, it's culture, which we, I didn't really, you know, mention that, um, you know, last time, but I mentioned the opposite of what happens with an ind individualistic culture, right? We're not so modest, right? But if you're modest, you're more likely to be likable, okay? And there are cultural differences in modesty, all right? Research shows, and some of you may not like what this says, but uh, research shows that compared to European Americans, African Americans are more tolerant of bragging. So in other words, African Americans don't have to be so modest and could still be likable. And you see it in the music videos and the rap videos and all this stuff, right? Where they're bragging, and I got all these homes, and you know, got all these women, all these jewelry, all these cars, right? You still like them, right? It's more tolerable if you're African American, if you're black, right, to brag. Then if you're white, if you're white and, you're, and you brag, oh, look at you all in title or whatever, oh, you know, uh, born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it must be, must be good, right, to be like you, like, well, all of us are not that lucky. You know, that kind of stuff, right? They're more likely to accept your, you bragging if you are black, if you're African-American, so that's the, what the research shows. And why is that? I would love to get your opinion. This would lead to discussion. Um, but what people have told me is, you know what? African-Americans have had it really hard. They've had to overcome a lot of racism and discrimination, a lot of stuff. So when they make it, they have every right to brag and say, yeah, I'm here. I made it despite all of that, right? And it's actually a good thing. Well, the rest of you, you're just bragging and people don't like you very much. I think I might've said this already, but I'll say it as it relates to this, right? You think you're a big shot and you show up to the hood, so to speak, or, you know, let's say you're, you're Latino, right? And you show up to the hood and your your nice Mercedes stuff like that. Say, look at me, I made it, right? You know what's gonna happen to you? They're gonna key your car. That's what's gonna happen to you, right? For bragging, for not being modest. No, you have to be modest, okay? 
and talk about how you're not such a big shot, that you're not so smart, you're not so wonderful, and give credit to other people. Asian Americans are the most likely to be modest. They're the most likely to project modesty. They're the ones who are more likely to say, no, it's not because of me, it's because of you. It's, you know, I, you know, it's, it, I'm not really that smart. It's just, I was lucky or whatever it is. It's part of their culture. Uh, I know in America, it might be different. Maybe they're learning different things in American, Asian Americans, right? Um, but if they're more traditional, right? The more traditional they are, the more they are told that, no, you don't matter. You're not that important, okay? You give credit to others, right? You don't call attention to yourself. And they're taught things like that. There's even a saying, I think it's Chinese, that says, uh, I'm not going to say it in Chinese, of course, but in English, but it, that's, it says something like, or it might be Japanese, actually. It says that the nail that sticks out will be struck down. In other words, don't be bragging. Don't be calling to your attention to yourself, right? You need to basically fit in and be like everybody else. And even when you are successful, you need to be modest. People won't like you if you're not. And yeah, I mean, for the most part, Asian Americans come across uh, as being usually very nice because most of them are modest. I know there's some that brag and stuff like that. I don't know too many of them that do. Um, I'm not sure I can think of, uh, of one actually, uh, but they're usually more modest. It's part of their culture. African-Americans, according to research, they're more likely to brag and it's more acceptable. European-Americans, Latinos, you're not supposed to brag that much. People won't like you, okay? Especially if you're white. Okay, but uh, Latinos, we have a similar thing too. For Latinos, it's like, we don't like it. If uh, other people succeed and they're calling attention to themselves, it's like, yeah, you're no better than me. I'll show you who's better. And then you try to kick their ass or something like that, right? Or key their car, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's messed up, right? That, but, you know, uh, that's really what I've experienced. That's what, uh, that's what happens out there, right? I have a brother who's uh, a... Uh, he, uh, he was the first one to go to college. He went to Berkeley. And then uh, after that, he went to law school and got his law degree um, and, you know, became a lawyer and that kind of stuff. You should see the extent to which my extended family hated him just because he was successful and he was the first one. They hated him <laughs> with a passion. Now we're older. Now they don't hate him so much. They still don't like him that much. But it, it's because he's success successful. And not only that, it, not just because of his success, but because he was never modest about it too. And by the way, he also happens to be very good looking. He's the best looking one in the family, okay? Yeah, women throwing themselves at him and stuff like that. He's good looking and smart and worked hard to be successful. And they hated him for it, you know, the extended family because he makes the rest of us look bad. I eventually others, you know, of us also became successful, you know, but I'm more modest than, than he is. I'm not, that, I'm not that much of a of a show off. I've learned through trial and error that, you know, not to show off that much and stuff like that. And then you'll see me driving a modest car, or drive a little crappy little Corolla, you know, probably only worth like four grand and stuff like that. Um, I don't really care about showing off or anything like that. Uh, more about uh, appearing like, more about modesty. Um, <clears throat> there are differences among people. Uh, women are actually more likely than men. Okay. It's just in comparison to men, women are more likely to smile. Women are more likely to compliment others, say nice things to other people. Women are more likely to agree with others. And women are more likely to present themselves modestly. Men are more likely to show off. And guess who's more likable? Women are more likable. Men are not as likable. I'm not saying men can't be likable. But on average, women are more likable than men. Men are more awful than women in just so many ways, okay? It's part of our biology. Women are more likely to be modest, be modest, be nice to people, that kind of stuff, right? If you are, um, you know, uh, let's say you did something and you've got to face the judge, uh, you'll probably have better chances of getting a, a lenient sense being treated well and fairly if you have a female judge than if you have a male judge. I'm not saying the females can't be mean. They can be very mean, some of them. It's so part of it has to do with luck. But they're more likely to be, you know, to be nice and treat you well and more likely to be modest. And part of that has to do with the fact with how that's to do with how they're raised. Okay, uh, why are women more modest? Socialization. That's how they're raised, right? Women uh, have been taught, but that they're gonna get more social rewards for being agreeable. As a woman, you are taught to be nice, right? To take other people's feelings into account, to be more nurturing. Part of it is biology as well, but that's what you're taught, right? Mean women are not very likable at all. We treat mean women as a society very poorly. Okay, or women who are very assertive in general. 
okay? We don't like those. Uh, I'm not saying I don't, but in general, right? But women are taught that you have to be nice, you have to get along with people, you have to be kind and nurturing, right? That's what a good woman is. As a man, you're taught to be strong and be tough and don't take crap from people, that kind of stuff. Very different type of socialization, all right? Um, biology matters as well. Women have less testosterone and testosterone relates to being disagreeable, confrontational, smiling less. Men have a lot more testosterone on average than women. And that's why we're worse in so many ways. Disagreeable, we'll disagree, we'll fight with people, we'll confront them. We're less likely to smile, more likely to cause trouble, right? Part of it is just biology, but a lot of it is also learning. So both of those things matter. Okay, uh, let's see. The next part is appear competent. So that's another goal. So I'll stop there.